Natural gas, of the sort many people use in their homes, and many countries use throughout their infrastructural stack for various sorts of energy needs, perhaps especially heating purposes, but also for cooking stoves as a vehicle fuel and as part of the manufacturing process for substances like plastic has been used by humans as a source of energy since at least 500 B.C., based on recorded evidence of its use, though perhaps as early as 1000 B.C., based on somewhat flimsier evidence. In either case, though, the earliest recorded use of this naturally occurring gas was in China, where digging and drilling for saltwater solutions used to brine food led to the discovery of underground pockets of gas, which was then in some cases transported using a clever system of pipes made from bamboo, either to a central location where it could then be used to prepare some types of food, or in at least one case to a sort of brine processing plant where the gas could be used to power a fire that then helped those running this plant to boil that brine and extract salt from it. Periodic but sparse use of this type of gas continued in China and likely elsewhere around the world as well, though there's little or no recorded evidence of this, so it's difficult to say where and when and for what purposes if that is indeed the case. But that continued to be the case until the late 1700s when some companies in Britain began to provide natural gas derived from coal to cities for the purpose of powering street lamps and then eventually powering lamps inside the home as well. That same model of providing natural gas to city infrastructure and homes was replicated in the United States by the early 1800s Baltimore was the first city to power public lamps with manufactured gas, but the first natural gas well was dug in the United States in 1821 in New York, and about 15 years later, there was enough well and pipe-based infrastructure in place to provide a sort of natural gas as a utility service for, at first, mostly wealthier families at their homes, and then eventually around cities as street lamps, then towns, then smaller, less well-off family homes as well. This gas was generally used at first almost exclusively for lighting purposes, but in 1885, a German chemist named Robert Bunsen invented what became known as the Bunsen burner, which used natural gas to create heat that was suitable for cooking, combustion, and sterilization, among other purposes. Throughout the 20th century, some aspects of gas processing, but primarily the development of better piping and gas pumping systems, allowed natural gas to be used for heating and cooking purposes in the home, alongside its newfound use in some types of boiler that allowed for the generation of electricity. For a long time, then, Natural gas was more of a curiosity than a practical fuel source. There's evidence that some groups of northeastern Native Americans, for instance, were aware of the gas's properties, but typically used it for entertainment or ceremonial purposes, rather than as a power source. We also, for a long time, primarily obtained this gas as a byproduct of either coal processing or oil production. It naturally occurs in many of the same geological pockets as these other fuel sources, so we took it where we could find it, but it wasn't generally the main attraction. It was just an added bonus for folks mining other than more desirable energy-related treasures. In many cases, too, especially until the early 20th century, much of this gas was seen as kind of just an inconvenience 
we were pumping oil and there was all this dangerous gas around when we were trying to do so. And as a result, we would either let it vent into the atmosphere the best that we could to get it out of the way, or we would burn it off so that we didn't have to think about it and we could more easily get to the main attraction, the oil. This is still something that you see in some places around the world today, the areas that haven't set up a natural gas industry. And that is why some oil wells have flares of fire up at the top of the drilling apparatus. They're burning off gas. That's essentially what you would burn if you had a gas stove or a gas furnace in your home. The trouble with venting gas, though, is that although we call it natural gas as a product name, it's basically just methane and some other small amounts of other gases mixed in, most commonly carbon dioxide, helium, hydrogen sulfide, or nitrogen. So in practice, when we release natural gas into the atmosphere, we're releasing primarily methane into the atmosphere, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. It's approximately 84 times more potent in terms of global warming potential compared to carbon dioxide over the course of 20 years. And we are releasing that up into the atmosphere in huge quantities. When we burn it, too, natural gas can add to the global climate change problems we face. Burning methane produces 30% less carbon dioxide as a byproduct than oil and about 45% less than coal. And it doesn't produce additional particles of ash and other tiny pollutants like those other fuel types, which is a good thing in terms of general air quality. But it does still produce something. And the production of natural gas in some cases can actually be more harmful to the ozone layer and atmosphere than comparable, also polluting, also greenhouse gas emitting fuel types. Because of how much energy is used and how much environmental damage is caused by the process of producing it, practices like fracking, a casual term for hydraulic fracturing, which basically means using highly pressurized bursts of water and pushing that pressurized water underground, which cracks open shale rocks that contain natural gas. Ultimately, then, while there are some advantages to natural gas over other fossil fuel-based energy sources, it is still not a renewable resource. It's not clean and green the way that it is sometimes portrayed, and it's not without other adjacent environmental consequences. Despite that reality, though, natural gas is being promoted and funded as a sort of transitional energy source for the interstitial period between today and our 100% renewables-based future, which, if everything goes according to plan, will arrive sometime this century. What I'd like to talk about today is why that's the case, whether there's any truth or value to that particular portrayal, and what it might mean for how we structure our near-future energy stack. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, consider becoming a supporter. One of the simplest ways to do so is to become a patron at patreon.com slash letsknowthings. But there's a list of other options, both monetary and non-monetary, at letsknowthings.com slash support. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I'd like to start with today comes from the Wall Street Journal, and it's entitled, Towns Trying to Ban Natural Gas Face Resistance in Their Push 
for all electric homes. The meta-context of the topic of this article is that the world is undergoing a significant shift in terms of energy generation and utility, primarily because of the current and foretold impacts of human-amplified climate change, a shift in the systems that shape the weather patterns we experience here on Earth, basically, that's been in some cases caused and in other cases merely made more extreme by our churning some types of gas, often called greenhouse gases, into the atmosphere through our burning of fossil fuels at a much higher rate than natural processes would otherwise do, especially from the Industrial Revolution onward. Because of that shift and how much havoc it could and already is wreaking on human civilization, we're in the process as a species of changing over from those sorts of gas-emitting energy sources to energy sources that do not emit such gases. So while things like wind power, hydropower, geothermal power, solar power are not 100% without negative consequences, especially in their construction, upkeep, and land usage, which is on average higher than what is required for more typical energy sources like oil and coal and natural gas, they do not emit these types of gases into the atmosphere as an ongoing consequence of their use. So that tends to make them a better option for a scenario like the one in which we find ourselves now in 2021. The general consensus of global governments, then, is that we need to make this shift post-haste. And in many cases, for most countries, that means getting at least halfway to a completely renewables-based energy setup sometime in the next few decades. And for most wealthy countries, at least, completing that shift to 100% by 2050 or 2060, depending on the country, and their current overall scale as a country, and the scale of their economy and emissions-based energy setup that powers it. Corporations are doing the same, making similar agreements and declarations. And this seems to be something that's finally happening after many decades of awareness of this issue, a developing scientific consensus about it, significant pushback against it by ideological and economic interests, that aren't too keen on such a changeover, and then the eventual broad governmental acceptance and consensus, with few exceptions as of 2021, that yeah, this is something we should probably be doing. So that's the context in which this story takes place. We're making a change as a global civilization, and it's going to be difficult and expensive and tedious, and probably laden with all sorts of issues and costs that we can't foresee currently. But it's ostensibly happening, nonetheless, because the consequences of not making such a change would seem to be so massive and devastating that it makes sense to face all of those risks and costs. Natural gas, as I mentioned in the intro, is a fossil fuel, like coal and oil. You burn it to get to the energy that was stored in it over the course of geological time spans. And the output of that chemical reaction is energy and carbon dioxide, and sometimes other compounds as well, like sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxide, depending on the nature of the gas and the way in which it is treated and used. But, as I also mentioned in the intro, Natural gas is in several ways less polluting in terms of particulates in the air, but also in terms of how much CO2 and other gases it puts into the atmosphere compared to coal and oil. So even as we make this transition, there's an argument being made that while yes, we need to end up with all renewables by something like 2050 or 2060, and honestly, ideally before that, but practically we need to hit that target by 2050 or 2060. In the meantime, though, we have, in the U.S. at least, about 42% of residential energy consumption originating with natural gas, and only 43% coming from straight-up electricity. And many countries around the world have similar energy source compositions. While most homes 
will have electrical outlets then. Many will also have gas-burning stoves and maybe a gas-powered furnace. It's more common in some areas than others, and all electric homes are increasingly the norm. But our starting point in this shift toward renewables is heavily slanted, in some aspects of our energy usage at least, toward natural gas. Many areas where natural gas is more common have a lot of laws and regulations and subsidies on the books that favor gas over other energy types, either because of tradition or as an effort to support local natural gas interests or because of lobbying efforts from natural gas companies and organizations. Some of these areas are in the process of removing or changing these gas-favoring policies and inclinations by phasing out permits that allow new homes to be built with gas energy infrastructure or raising costs on gas-related permits, either immediately or after a certain date. Disincentives, basically, rather than outright bans on this type of power source. There's often a counter-incentive at play here, though, as all electric infrastructure, homes where everything is powered by pure electricity, generated elsewhere, currently by a variety of different sources, but which will eventually be powered off-site by a collection of renewable sources. These sorts of homes and buildings are today typically at least a little bit more expensive at the outset than homes that use some electricity but gas for everything else. And this is especially true in areas that have natural gas infrastructure deeply enmeshed and entangled and intermingling throughout the region, and in areas where heating needs are significant and continuous throughout the winter months. It often requires a decent amount of electricity to heat a home compared to achieving the same amount of heat with gas power. So while all electric homes cost about the same as partially or completely gas-powered homes throughout most of the United States, and all electric homes will almost always cost less to keep maintained and to operate over time. In some parts of the country, in Denver and Minneapolis, for instance, all electric homes cost, on average, about $11,000 more to build than comparable homes that use gas alongside electricity. And that additional fee is significant enough to nudge the builders constructing these homes and buildings toward gas, even when it is clear that the country is shifting away from its use. There have been some pushes from builders' organizations, then, to keep the gas flowing. There's also a very serious and well-funded effort coming from the gas industry itself, which perceives this shift in a similar way to the rest of the fossil fuel industry as essentially a death knell for the product it is offering and the investments that it has made over the decades, including a bunch of assets that, without this shift, would probably last a good while longer. The U.S. only has the fourth largest proven natural gas reserves in the world, after Russia, Iran, and Qatar, but it does produce more natural gas than any other country in the world as of the first quarter of the 21st century. And those resources and the infrastructure built atop them are significant enough assets that the natural gas industry has deployed a full-on public relations and lobbying push to change the common perception of their product in order to ensure their continued existence and their ability to keep milking those existing assets for at least a few more decades. Southern California Gas, a natural gas company that is based exactly where you would expect it to be based, set up a group called Californians for Balanced Energy Solutions, which, like many such front organizations, formed for the purposes of muddying the waters around controversial topics, does not indicate that it is run by this gas company on its website. 
and it generally tries to portray its efforts and the data that it presents as being third-party and unbiased, despite essentially just arguing the company's talking points from what would seem to the casual observer, to the layman, to be an outside perspective. A group of gas and gas pipeline companies has tried the same trick in the U.S. Pacific Northwest with a front organization called Partnership for Energy Progress. And both companies attempt, through what amounts to public relations and lobbying work, to influence the conversation around natural gas, trying, for instance, to get it labeled in news broadcasts and in the common narrative as a clean alternative to coal and gas, and to get it mentioned as much as possible alongside zero-carbon renewables like solar and hydro. Again, it is absolutely true that natural gas is better in some ways than coal and petroleum, but many of these efforts are flagrantly disingenuous and in some cases have even sparked lawsuits because of how fast and loose they've played things in terms of attempting to make it seem as if they had no role in the formation of these front companies. So while this is not an uncommon tactic, it's important to note that a lot of the narrative about natural gas being clean and future-facing was written directly by people paid to sell and promote that narrative. It's not something that has emerged into the ether via uninterested energy world experts or science journals or anything like that. These new public relations efforts, by the way, are kind of a continuation of mid-20th century PR pushes by the gas industry to promote their product as the ideal energy source for the home. They came up with the slogans, quote, gas, the wonder fuel for cooking, end quote, and, quote, quickest heat, higher heat, steadiest heat. You get them all, only with gas, the most responsive fuel, end quote, both of which started running in the late 1930s and got very big post-World War II, and that led to a perception in the U.S., during a period when a lot of new homes were being built, that fancier, more upscale, better homes had gas cooking ranges, rather than electric. This perception has largely stuck around, and it's still repeated as tried and true wisdom, despite there being cleaner alternatives that have the same or very similar heating properties as gas ranges available on the market today. Also, we now know that alongside the greenhouse gas pollution emitted by gas ranges, that indoor pollution is heightened by having such systems in one's kitchen. Nitrogen dioxide levels in gas-powered kitchens in particular tend to exceed healthy levels according to national air quality standards. So while there are definitely pros to gas-powered infrastructure, including residential infrastructure, there are quite a few cons as well, and a lot of the former have been emphasized by all of this well-funded public messaging, while the downsides have been substantially downplayed by the same. These companies have also invested in non-public relations-related efforts to bulwark their position against the tidal wave of statements and impending legislation that would seem to be very bad for their future as ongoing economic interests. After a few dozen municipalities in California banned natural gas hookups in new construction buildings and those that have been substantially renovated, alongside similar efforts in Colorado and Washington, natural gas companies and their lobbyists have pushed for local bans on natural gas bans and bans on other legislation that might threaten their future in these areas. As of the first half of 2021, such bans on gas bans exist in Arizona, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Tennessee, and they've been proposed in Texas, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Pennsylvania, Utah, Indiana, Arkansas, Kentucky, and Mississippi. Ultimately, though, Despite all these efforts, it does seem like the American, but also the global, 
natural gas industry, is aware that things are changing, and some of these companies are already beginning to diversify their investments into other next-step technologies and assets. The main purpose of these pushes, with that in mind, seems to be establishing natural gas as a legitimate intermediary liminal energy source for the period between the early 2020s when the scale of the climate problem we face finally seemed to sink in with governments around the world on an actionable scale, and mid-century, when a lot of these newly established goals are meant to culminate with a cleaner collection of energy systems. The argument in favor of using natural gas in this way as a temporary solution between where we are and where we'd like to be is similar to the argument currently being made in China, which is by far the heaviest coal user in the world, which seems to be planning to decommission older, less efficient coal power plants over the course of the next several decades, while continuing to upkeep and iterate and even build more of the newer, more efficient coal power plants. Continuing to burn coal for electricity, basically, but scaling it down by counterintuitively investing in existing and new coal infrastructure that is better in terms of efficiency and emissions compared to the old stuff. Replacing really bad stuff with slightly less bad stuff, basically. Natural gas seems to offer a similar option elsewhere. The idea being that it is not perfect and not at all ideal for where we want to be, but it is better, especially if we can plug the great many holes in natural gas infrastructure that allows gobs of methane to leak into the atmosphere each year. If we could do that, it would be substantially better than the fossil fuel alternatives that we have available today. And because we can only build greener energy infrastructure so fast, and because the world is using more energy all the time, which is a good thing in some ways, because as people move out of poverty, they tend to use more energy. So this is an indication that that is probably continuing apace. But because of that, we may need temporary intermediary energy solutions that are not ideal and which should only be temporary, but which may help us get to that next step, that totally renewable future, without having to sacrifice so much in the process. Sacrifices that might even create new problems, new humanitarian crises as a consequence of switching over without first having sufficient renewable infrastructure in place to fulfill everyone's baseline needs. The counter-argument to that argument is that if we invested in solving this problem properly, we could move much faster than we are, and we could shove a bunch of economic entities that are well entrenched but holding us back out of the way in the process. There will be trials and tribulations along the path to 100% renewables, basically, but the optimal response to that reality is not to step back and build and defend things and entities that are part of the problem we're trying to solve. We need to pull off the bandage and incentivize progress and movement, not take it slow and do things inefficiently and ponderously because that will be easier. Easier on some people and governments and corporate entities more than others. It is an open question which perspective will win out here though it's a fair bet that we will see different areas globally coming down on different sides of this conversation, and perhaps at different points along the spectrum, in between those two polar choices as well. In the meantime, we will continue to see new gas pipelines, new politicking over those pipelines, new arguments in favor of and against them, and likely quite a bit of public relations-related narrative building on all sides of this issue. If you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter 
One of the simplest non-monetary ways of doing that is to leave a quick review wherever you get your podcasts. But you can also share the show with a friend who you think might enjoy it, share your favorite episode on social media, and or just drop me a line and tell me something about yourself. I love hearing from the folks who are on the other end of this show, and it would be great to make your electronic acquaintance. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support this show wherever you happen to be in the world, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book that I'd like to recommend today is called Destined for War, Can America and China Escape Thucydides' Trap? by Graham Allison. I picked up this book because I am fascinated by this truism that has emerged, that the U.S. and China are headed on a path that inevitably leads to some type of military conflict. And I personally don't believe that to be the case, but I also understand to a certain degree the expediency of forwarding such a narrative in both of these countries, despite the fact that there are so many risks of doing so. And this book was a pretty good overview of the concept and that narrative and some of the variables that are in place that make some type of conflict more or less likely in the foreseeable future. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of Destined for War by Graham Allison. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript for this episode and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other podcast, Brain Lenses, wherever you get your podcasts or at brainlenses.com. You can sign up to receive a daily morning email from me in which I curate and summarize the news at onesentencenews.com. And feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram and most of the other ones. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.